to welcome everyone to the podcast. We call this From the Preacher's Study. My name is Bob Hutto. I'm the preacher here at the Oak Mountain Church of Christ. and my co-worker and partner in this endeavor. My colleague and brother in Christ and friend, mm-hmm. Kevin Clark, uh, is join, going to join me this evening, as always. Uh, we've been studying from 1 Timothy, and so encourage you, if you have your Bible, to turn to that place. If you're in a position where you don't have your Bible or can't can't do it, maybe you're driving in the car or or doing other things and you can't open your Bible, at least listen to us, listen carefully for the next few minutes. We hope to bring some things out of the text that are worthwhile and and beneficial to us and will help us along the way. That's really our objective in this is just to open the Bible, look at the text, draw out what the text has to say, try to ascertain the meaning, see what God wants us to see from that, apply it to our given situations in life, and hopefully we can adapt our lives and mold our lives in the way that God wants us to go. And so 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, we're going to review a little bit of what we talked about up to this point and then make our way into some new uh, some new material. Kevin, anything you want to say by way of introduction? Yeah, you know, Paul is an extraordinary Bible character, and anytime you have an opportunity to get some insight into his personality and his approach to things, uh, it is a joy, it is a privilege, and we're certainly going to do that. We see in this book uh, so much about his life and what God did in his life and how he reacted to that. We're going to see the relationship between him and uh, his son in the faith, Timothy, and and that's really encouraging and endearing to us, and, and so many practical things that we can immediately apply to our own lives. Obviously, this is between an older preacher and a younger preacher, but there are some general principles that go well beyond just those who preach that we can apply right. as Christians in our day-to-day lives. So very thankful for this uh, opportunity, thankful for this platform. And certainly as we talk about that, we want to thank our two deacons, Mark Townsend and Jason Reed, for their talents that they lend to this endeavor and have from the very beginning. Really appreciate that. Uh, They and their families and the sacrifices they've made. We've made the point several times. We could not do this podcast without them. And so we are so blessed to have their uh, talents and abilities that give us this platform that in turn allows us to spread the word, not only in this country, but across the world. And we're thankful to all the people who tune in to, to listen to us. You know, Paul really is an, an interesting figure in, in the scriptures. He writes letters. He can be very direct and blunt and right to the point at times. And and sometimes we may think that's that's really uh, the, you know, that that's, that's his whole personality. <laughs> but if you look closely and you study closely, mm-hmm. you can see... There's another side to there Paul. Is, there really is. Uh, he can be very tender, Absolutely. very emotional Absolutely. Uh, in his comments. And you see that in his relationship with Timothy. Right, right. My true child in the faith mm-hmm. is very strong feelings for Timothy. And not, not only Timothy, there are others mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And so he's he's a whole person, I guess he we is. might say. That's he right. kind of has that emotional side to him that, right. that's tender and, and kind of delicate at times. Mm-hmm. But then he can be stern and he sure. can be direct as well. And so... Right. He's a good choice, isn't he? He's yeah, a good absolutely. choice to, much so. to do the things that the Lord would have him to do. Amen. All right, so let's look at this First Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul has left Timothy in the city of Ephesus to work with the church there. We talked a little bit about the background of the church at mm-hmm. Ephesus uh, in uh, previous previous studies. And so it's the church at Ephesus is being troubled by false teachers. And so you see that in verse 3, mm-hmm. that Paul leaves uh, Timothy in Ephesus to charge certain men not to teach strange doctrines. And we get some insight into the nature of that doctrine in verse 4. Nor to pay attention to myths and endless endless genealogies. And so that doesn't tell us a whole lot about what's going on there, and that might fit uh, different kinds of false teaching. But it seems that these false teachers have some connection with the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. Because as you go down into verse 7, it Mm -hmm. says... If they want to be teachers of the law, mm-hmm. even though they don't understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. And then he goes on to talk a little bit about the law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there's plenty of genealogical material in mm-hmm. the law of Moses mm-hmm. that they might speculate about and, right. and talk about. And we're not exactly sure how uh, the, the law and the myths and genealogies all combine together. But in, in wh- whatever they were doing with those, it, it was erroneous. It, right. it was error. Mm-hmm. And Paul leaves Timothy in Ephesus to, to address that. I, I just, I, I, as I was looking over the passage earlier today, it just impressed me what the result of their teaching mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. And so in verse four, it gives rise to speculation. Mm-hmm. And then verse six, people have strayed from the things that Paul wants to teach 
and they've turned aside to fruitless discussion, mm -hmm. speculation and fruitless mm -hmm. discussion. If your Bible class is spending time on speculation and fruitless <laughs> discussion, maybe you need to reorient right. uh, your, uh, uh, your, your attention. And so that's, that was the result of what these false teachers were doing. And you mm -hmm. contrast that mm -hmm. with what Paul wanted to accomplish. And right. so you see that again in verse four, mm -hmm. rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Mm -hmm. I think the idea there is uh, instead of speculation, what we need to be about is building That's up right. the right. house of mm -hmm. God, is implementing the plan mm -hmm. of God. And so we need to be doing some serious work, some serious Bible study, serious explanation and application that results in building mm -hmm. up the house of God. And mm -hmm. so the administration of God, which is by, by faith. It's almost like he's telling them, take a step back. And what are we trying to do here? And he says, the purpose of the commandment, verse five, is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and from a sincere faith. And if you're not promoting those things, you don't see that as the result of your work and your teaching, there's something wrong because that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> right. It, yeah, that's a great point. Verse five, the goal of our instruction is love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so whatever we're doing, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, what we're trying to, to create is, is a place where the environment is characterized by love. Mm -hmm. People love each other. Right. Uh, people love God. People love the truth. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean, well, just anything goes no, no, and no. we just love right. each other. Right, right. But what we're trying to accomplish in our work mm -hmm. is we're trying to instill and promote love mm -hmm. between between the brethren, mm -hmm. uh, the members of, of the congregation. Absolutely. And so he talks about love a pure heart, a good conscience, sincere mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. And those are all really features and what he's what he's trying to do, the goal right. of our work. Mm -hmm. um, love, of course, is critical in the, the plan of God. Mm -hmm. it's, there's several passages we could look at to, that highlight that. Uh, the, the greatest commandment mm -hmm. is love God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and love your neighbor you as yourself. yourself. That's right. We know 1 Corinthians chapter 13, mm -hmm. I can do great things, but if I don't have love, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm really nothing. Love is really at the core of, of what we what we do if, if we want to please God right. about it. We have uh, purified our souls unto unfeigned mm -hmm. love mm -hmm. of the brethren. Mm -hmm. Love one another from the heart mm -hmm. fervently. Peter uh, tells his readers in 1 Peter chapter 1, mm -hmm. Hebrews 13 verse 1, mm -hmm. let love the well, brethren love. continue. continue yeah. So and so love is really at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish through the gospel, building up the body of Christ, building up the the house of God, so that we love God mm -hmm. and we love and we love one another, and we put that into practice as we relate to each other every day. And again, that doesn't mean you gloss over things that need to be addressed and right. gloss over things that need to be corrected, mm -hmm. but you do it with love, speaking the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And so that Paul says that's the goal, that's the end, uh, or that's what we're trying to accomplish with our our work. In fact, you know that's not what you're saying because he's saying in this very section, you need to admonish these men against what they're doing. Charge them that they teach no other doctrine. So that's also a manifestation of love is addressing error. So you're right. It's not glossing over because he's telling him there's error and you need to address that's it. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So in verse 7, they, it says these teachers, they want to be teachers of the law even though they don't understand either what they are saying or matters about which they make confident assertions. It's interesting to me. They, they're very confident people, weren't they? They're mm -hmm. making confident assertions, mm -hmm. but they don't know what they're talking about. Right. <laughs> That's what Paul, Paul said. They don't know what they're talking about, right. although they say it very confidently. Right. You know, right. they're, What they're saying is, is not correct. You know, I've, I think I've noticed through the years that Often people are swayed by the way a thing, an idea is pre presented, mm -hmm. as opposed compared to the content. Right. And so, if a person stands before a group of people, preaches a sermon or, or a Bible class, and he's confident in mm -hmm. what he says, mm -hmm. and you know he says it with that assurance, and right. you know he just and uh, people that that will sway people. Mm -hmm. so, and people yeah. are you know, sometimes, not always, mm -hmm. but sometimes. Don't listen carefully enough to what is said. Right, right. They're swept away by how it's said. Mm -hmm. And so these people, they, again, Paul says, they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertion. Right. you got to look beyond the presentation and look at the content of what is said. What's that old saying? Often wrong, never in doubt. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Often 
often wrong, but never in doubt. That's right. That's right. That, that, that sounds like these men, doesn't it? Right, right. Well, then he goes on to talk a little bit about the law. And so mm-hmm. they want to be teachers of the law. And then verse 8, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Mm-hmm. Now, that's an interesting statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, let, let's talk about that for for a few minutes, uh, really verses 8 through 11. Mm-hmm. Now, the New Testament teaches us that the law of Moses has been done away. That's and right. so uh, there are several passages that would illustrate that. Hebrews chapter 10, for example, and verse 9, this is at the end of a really lengthy discussion about the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and it coming to an end. But he says here in chapter 10 and verse 9, at the end of that verse, he takes away the first, that is the first covenant. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. And so the first covenant, the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, mm-hmm. that's been that's been taken away. And a new covenant, a new testament mm-hmm. has taken its place. Another passage along those lines, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. He himself is our peace who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And so he brought that to an end. He Mm -hmm. abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So again, another passage that would suggest to us that the law of Moses is, is really no longer binding on on us. And there are other passages as well. I think about Colossians chapter 2. At the end of the a discussion, he says in verse 16, therefore, mm-hmm. no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so these elements of the law of Moses, the Sabbath day, mm-hmm. the the annual feast feast days, those were all features of the law, contained a shadow of the good things to come. But now that the substance is here, well, the shadow is is done away, and so we know that we're not under uh, the the law of Moses. Uh, we're not obligated to keep the ceremonies or the rituals or the feast days or or any of those kinds of things associated with the law of Moses. But Paul says, now the law is good if we use it lawfully. Mm -hmm. I take that to mean there there are legitimate uses for the law. So no, we're not under the law of Moses. We're not under the sacrificial system Mm -hmm. or uh, animal sacrifices and stuff like that. But the law is good if we use it lawfully. There Mm -hmm. there are legitimate uses for the law. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we could fill that out in... In different ways, you know, the law brings us to Christ. Mm-hmm. The law yeah, makes yeah, us aware that, of right. sin and right. how much we need Paul a Savior point, and yeah. things like that. But I think what he's saying here is the law helps us to hold immorality yes. in check. Yeah. Yes. And so even though <clears throat> you know the, the law of Moses has been taken away, still, mm-hmm. as far as moral instruction right. is concerned, right. Mm-hmm. It has a legitimate use. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's right. And he goes on and said, law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate. So it, it's giving a standard of living. And he's saying if a person is already living that, that's not designed for them. It's for those people that are not. Uh, the law tells you what not to do. And if you look at the things he's talking about, I like your point, really those things fall into the category of moral teaching. We're not talking about ceremonial things. He talks about being profane, being murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, fornicators. Those are all moral issues liars, any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. I think that's a great point that you make, and those things are still in place. In fact, we see a lot of those things from the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament as well. Right. So morality, our standard of morality, is really rooted in the character Mm -hmm. of God Mm -hmm. himself. And so Mm -hmm. we are to be pure as he is pure. We're to be righteous as he is righteous. And so it's no wonder then that the the moral aspect of the teaching would largely stay the same right, between right. Old Covenant and New Covenant. Mm-hmm. And so it's still wrong to kill. It's still That's wrong right. to steal. That's right. It's still wrong to commit adultery. That's right. So yes, we're not under the law of Moses. Right, right. Uh, but it has a legitimate use, mm-hmm. one of which is to hold in check immorality and to right. inform us what kind of moral and ethical behavior God is 
displeased with and, and pleased with. Yeah, you expect that because our God hasn't changed, all right? The God, right. sometimes people try to divide between the God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament. Yeah. It's the same God. God was displeased with lying then. He's displeased with lying now. He's displeased with fornication then. He's displeased with fornication now. So, you know, it, it makes sense that those things would stay the same. And so he gives us a little bit of, of a list. If you are familiar with the letters of Paul, you know, he likes mm-hmm. a good list. He does. He there does. are lots of lists in his, in his letters. But he goes on to say, Uh, We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, Mm -hmm. but for those who are lawless and rebellious. And so the law is there to hold them in In check, check. you know, to keep them from just being unrestrained and doing all sorts of evil and harmful things to people. And so the law is made for those, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, Mm -hmm. for those who kill their fathers or mothers. That seems a little extreme, doesn't it? It does, it does. I wonder if he doesn't have, if he's not speaking exactly literally there, but those Mm -hmm. who who, uh, dishonor their Mm -hmm. father and mother. Mm -hmm. The law of Moses... uh, condemn those who would curse father or mother, mm-hmm. but but maybe not. Maybe he is speaking literally. Right uh, for murderers, immoral men, or fornicators, homosexuals, kidnappers, mm-hmm. liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. And so, and so it's sound teaching. The law is good if you use it lawfully. Sound teaching would be um, teaching against immorality and promoting morality. And uh, this verse eleven sums it up. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted, with, and he's going to transition in right. to talk about his work in the gospel. And so these people, and if you think about it, there are a lot of mistakes made concerning the law of Moses today, trying to apply things from the mm-hmm. law of Moses today. Mm-hmm. Well, the law of Moses has been set aside. Right. There's legitimate uses for it, right. one of which is to inform us about moral morality and immorality. Mm-hmm. And we want to abstain from immoral conduct, right. which is contrary to the law, right. and become the kind of people that God would be pleased with, which would be an imitation of his moral character. Right. And you know, that ties it to the gospel, because it says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. So the idea of morality, it's not like, okay, we're in the New Testament, God doesn't care about morality anymore. Of course he cares about morality, right. even more so now, perhaps, uh, than before, because this glorious gospel requires us to live according to the standards set by his son. Right. So all of the Bible has value. All of the Bible is helpful to us. Old Testament, New Testament alike. We need to you know, do all we can to have a good understanding of both. We are New Testament Christian. I mean, we are Christians, of course. That's right. That's right. Uh, but uh, there's a valuable place for the law if we use it lawfully as well. We appreciate everybody listening today. That's Hope right. we've had some things to say that are beneficial. We're going to continue our look at First Timothy in our next session. Uh, anything you want to say in closing, Kevin? Uh, just, I, I think we're about to get into an interesting uh, part of the epistle where he talks about what God has done in his life. And it's really incredible when you look at this man's background and what he was doing before he met the Lord and then after he obeyed the gospel, how God uses him in his kingdom. And what a great lesson that is yeah. for all of us, what God can do with us when we submit humbly to his will. All right. Well, that's a good tease. Kevin, you know, we hope that uh, people will, will join us next time. We'll, we'll take that passage up and Amen. hope that uh, hope we, we it'll be encouraging to us. So Amen. let's close with a word of prayer. Kevin, would let's you lead us? The gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. Thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for the, the truly precious gift of life that you've bestowed upon us, giving us an opportunity to worship you, to serve you, to carry out your will. And we hope as we look upon our day, that we have done just that. And if we haven't, that we uh, identify that, confess that, repent of that, and to do better if you uh, so graciously provide us with another day tomorrow. We thank you for your will. We thank you for the revealed will that we've been studying all throughout this podcast. We're just uh, excited that we have your mind revealed for us in a way that we can grasp and understand and incorporate in our lives and order our lives around. And we hope that uh, those who are listening to us uh, have the same respect and reverence for your will and are eager and excited to hear it taught. And we hope that the teaching that we have engaged in has been consistent uh, with thy will that we have interjected, not ourselves and our own thoughts, but truly bringing out things that are in the scriptures themselves. And if we've done that, we know that uh, your word will not return into you void, that much good has been done uh, with the preaching and teaching of, of your word. We thank you for this specific study we had or we're having in, in First Timothy. Uh, very uh, excited about the opportunity to explore uh, what the Spirit inspired Paul to write uh, to Timothy, his son in the faith, 
so many different lessons that we've already gained. And, and one of the things we talked about t- tonight or th- at this uh, podcast is uh, the importance of morality and to have morality in our life. It was uh, ordained in the Old Testament. It's been ordained in the New Testament. There is a standard of living that you have for us, and please help us to, to understand that and to submit ourselves to that. We can't, uh, we're in the flesh, but we can't just follow the fleshly appetites that, that we often struggle against. We've got to learn how to bring those things under control, bring those things into check, bring them into conformance and harmony with your will. And that's an endeavor that we can do. Uh, we can do through strength in you. We can do through prayer and study and meditation and thinking on spiritual things. And, and we're just so uh, gratified that you've laid out for us how we should live this life and how we can uh, put in sub, uh, subject, subjection uh, some of our baser uh, instincts that we sometimes wrestle with being creatures in the flesh. We thank you for your will and, and all that it means for us. And thank you for the opportunity we have to spread it to others. Uh, we hope that everybody who's listening to this will take these things and talk to their neighbors, talk to their schoolmates, talk to their coworkers. just spread the word because we know once that's done, uh, the hearts of men will change. Not everybody's going to submit, not everybody's going to obey, but uh, those who have the right heart uh, will certainly do so. And please help those who are entrusted with the word, such as Paul was, to be careful uh, how they teach and what they teach Uh, that they evaluate their teaching in light of the scriptures and also in light of the outcome. As Paul told Timothy here, uh, we're not looking for disputes. We're not looking for idle talk. We're looking for a love uh, from uh, and sincere faith and and looking for uh, and sincerity and and obedience. And, And if we see those sorts of things, that's a good indication that the things that the man has been presenting are presented according to God's word. And let us avoid speculation Let's avoid things uh, that are not revealed. There are many things you have not revealed in your scriptures, and we need to stay away from those things and focus on the things that are revealed. Those things are for our edification, and those things are designed to make the man of God complete. And so that's a lifetime worth of work. We really don't have any time to dabble in the things you have not revealed. We're so very thankful for uh, your church and the uh, the blood of your son that makes us uh, eligible to be a part of that. Thank you for cleansing us from our past sins through obedience to the gospel. And if there's any under the sound of my voice who have not obeyed the gospel, please prick their hearts that they may do uh, what is necessary before it's everlasting too late. We ask that blessings, continued blessings on this podcast, continued blessings on the work that Bob is doing here at Oak Mountain and the work that all of us in this congregation are doing to be a light in this community. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.